Before 2022, most people around the world would have hardly recognized the words Donetsk and Luhansk, perhaps thinking that they sounded vaguely Eastern European or otherwise not thinking very much of the words at all. But since Russia's full-scale invasion of its smaller neighbor Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk have become synonymous with Vladimir Putin's efforts to assert his dominance over his Ukrainian neighbor. Long considered a quiet, almost sleepy pair of provinces in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region, Donetsk and Luhansk have since become embroiled in Vladimir Putin's long shadow game, two puppet states that exist to undermine the nation to which most of the world agrees that they rightfully belong. Today on Morographics, we're going to examine Donetsk and Luhansk in detail, what they used to be, what they've now become, and how they're quickly becoming the linchpin to what Vladimir Putin hopes to one day hail as his victory in Ukraine. Achieving a global consensus on what exactly Donetsk and Luhansk are today is an exceedingly difficult proposition, so as we endeavor to describe them, we're going to start with the very basics. The modern-day territories called Donetsk and Luhansk are the two halves of an area historically and currently known as the Donbass. Taking its name from a shortened blend of Donetsk Cold Basin, the Donbass is exactly what that term makes it sound like coal country. Highly industrialized since the late 1800s, the Donbass has produced massive amounts of coal across many decades, and historically, it formed a border between two powerful Cossack states, the Zaporozhian Sikh and the Don Cossack host. But when we attempt to characterize the modern-day Donbass in any meaningful way, we've immediately got a decision to make. Do we call it Ukrainian, or do we call it Russian? Geographically, the answer is pretty clear. Since the conclusion of the Russian Civil War in 1922, exactly 100 years prior to the modern Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Donbass was classified as part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, or SSR. The following years would see the Donbass region rocked by famine, the violent process of de Cossackization, occupation, and then forced labor deportations under the Nazis, and decade after decade of Russification. A broad demographic shift that we'll absolutely be talking about more, and that saw the Donbass accept more and more ethnic Russians over the course of Soviet history. After the Soviet Union ceased to exist, Donetsk and Luhansk were incorporated into the sovereign nation of Ukraine, but with a modern culture and a cultural and linguistic history that were fundamentally different from most of their fellow Ukrainians. So why wouldn't Donetsk and Luhansk, being part of Ukraine, be enough for the entire world to agree that they are a part of Ukraine. Well, that would be because of the self-declared Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, two separatist governments backed by Russia that have exerted a controlling influence inside the two provinces since 2014. With a history that traces back to pro-Russian anti-Ukrainian demonstrations immediately after Russia annexed the Ukrainian Isthmus of Crimea, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, or as we'll refer to them throughout this video, the DPR and the LPR, spent nearly a decade as the ruling authority in the Donbass prior to the Russian invasion. Now, where the DPR and the LPR are concerned, we've got to first correct one common misconception. Despite Vladimir Putin and the rest of Russia very eagerly supporting them through most of their history, they were not a part of Russia's plan initially. In fact, the Russian annexation of Crimea awoke a broader popular discontent with Ukrainian leadership in the Donbass, kicking off protests that were, by all accounts, genuine expressions by a part of the Donbass population. Of course, Russia seized on that part of the Donbass real quick. And before long, Russia was backing an armed separatist uprising that most locals appeared not to support. But by then, it was already too late. When a Ukrainian counterinsurgency pushed back the separatist rebels to small sections of Donetsk and Luhansk, Russia swooped in with greater force and basically invaded the Donbass. Before long, Ukraine agreed to a ceasefire that would contain the rebels to the Donbass, although they would also yield back a lot of the territory they had captured in their prior counterinsurgency. Between the time that the ceasefire was signed and the start of the wider war in Ukraine, the DPR and the LPR would host a low-grade continual conflict between themselves and the Ukrainian military. But while well, we'll return to the conflict in the Donbass in due time, we'll first highlight the mass exodus that took place during and after 2014. About 1.6 million people, according to Ukraine's government, were internally displaced from the Donbass and found their way to other parts of the country. Another million headed in the opposite direction, mostly to Russia. With a few exceptions, this largely reflected the ideological leanings of the Donbass expats themselves. Those who were pro-Ukraine went to Ukraine, and those who were pro-Russia went to Russia. 
The people who chose to stay, according to 2019 estimates, would include about a million and a half people in Luhansk and a bit over two million in Donetsk. For those who didn't try and get out, there could be no illusions about what they were signing up for. The DPR and the LPR were by then puppet states that knew full well that they could only exist with the backing of the Russian government. And with that Russian backing came a massive wave of Russian propaganda designed both to keep the people of Donetsk and Luhansk loyal and try to convince the rest of the world that Russia was taking a benevolent action in supporting the breakaway republics. The crux of that argument, then as now, was Russia's twofold claim that Ukrainian forces were perpetrating a genocide against Russian-speaking civilians in the Donbass and that Ukraine had been infiltrated by Nazis. Now look, we're not going to bother equivocating about those thoroughly debunked claims, although we will emphasize that Russia has never even attempted to present evidence for its claims of genocide, and after a wide range of international experts have debunked the claim, Ukraine has recently taken the extra step to have the International Court of Justice investigate and debunk the accusation too. And while Ukraine's military and its far-right political scene do have neo-Nazi elements, especially in volunteer military battalions, their presence is not anywhere near so powerful to justify Putin's claims that Ukraine itself is a nation controlled by Nazis. But under the protective umbrella of that forceful Russian propaganda, the DPR and the LPR have had time to develop their own way of life, their own political systems, and their own strange reality, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine kicked off. As for how that reality works, well, in many ways, the DPR and the LPR have become caricatures of the same Russian nationalist ideology that guides Vladimir Putin's Russia. The DPR and the LPR are strongly ethno-nationalist in their political ideology, that the ethnic Russian diaspora around the world, and especially in the territories closest to Russia, belong as part of a unified ethno-state. Guiding that hypothetical nation are the principles and teachings of Russian Orthodox Christian fundamentalism, as well as the historical example of the Russian Empire, both as it existed before World War I and in the form of the Soviet Union. The breakaway republics are both led by a People's Council, with the DPR's current leader being one Denis Pashilin, and the LPR's being a guy named Leonid Pashinik. As for what life has been like in the Donbass in those years between the DPR and LPR's independence declarations and the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the picture is a bleak one. On the one hand, there are everyday concerns that people there face. Economic opportunity is limited, food is expensive and sometimes scarce, quality education is hard to come by, and people with connections in the rest of Ukraine have been severely limited in their ability to contact family and friends living on the other side of the conflict. Prices went high, wages went low, a crush of sanctions sharply limited people's ability to access their bank accounts or do business. Nearly half of those who did remain were aged 65 or older. Most people still in the Donbass are at least in their 40s, and most people with anything above a local education have long since left. Those who did stay have since reported to Western outlets that most of them chose not to do so because of any love for the DPR or the LBR, but because they had no money and no prospects anywhere else. But the other side of their reality is far darker. According to a wide range of observer bodies, including the UN, human rights abuses have run rampant in both breakaway republics, where the ruling regime has little to fear from anyone except a disinterested Vladimir Putin. In 2020, Freedom House gave the Eastern Donbass a score of 6 points out of 60 for civil liberty and negative 1 points out of 40 for political rights when assessing both republics together. Arbitrary detention and torture are reportedly common among the local security services, who are little more than bands of armed thugs with rifles and legal impunity. Executions and extrajudicial killings have been reported on many occasions, corruption runs rampant, and independent media, private bloggers, anonymous journalists, and even anti-regime social media have been extinguished. Politically, the DPR and the LPR are functionally totalitarian extensions of Russia's will inside the Donbass, and political opposition are prime targets for state enforcers, while just about every institution, be it education, media, or business, is under the firm control of loyalists to the separatist leadership. Now, with such a bleak, even totalitarian veil over the Donbass, it is easy to dismiss the LPR and the DPR as puppet states and nothing more. Cruel inventions of Vladimir Putin meant to keep order in an occupied territory at all costs. And well, you'd be right, but simply decrying the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics as sham governments misses a good deal 
of what's at play under the surface. Donetsk and Luhansk are internationally recognized parts of Ukraine. They have been annexed into Russia in a way that's illegal under international law, and also they're parts of Eastern Europe that haven't considered themselves to be truly Ukrainian for quite a while. Sitting in a sort of grey territorial region between Ukraine and Russia, the Donbass has long been home to both ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians, and to people who would prefer to show allegiance to Russia rather than Ukraine. Those numbers were increased dramatically after waves of Russian workers flooded into the Donbass in the aftermath of World War II, building lives there and settling down into their communities. A package of Soviet-era education reforms in which Ukrainian language schooling in the Donbass was put aside for a generation in favor of Russian language schooling only widens the growing divide. By 1989, nearly half of the Donbass self-reported Russian ethnic identity, and after a brief honeymoon period with the idea of post-Soviet independence under Ukraine, Donetsk and Luhansk were rocked by wave after wave of economic malaise. Chafing under centralized Ukrainian authority and questionable management in Kyiv, the people of the Donbass would vote overwhelmingly to adopt Russian as the administrative language in Donetsk and Luhansk, to make Russian a state language in Ukraine, and for Ukraine to operate more closely with the Russian-led Commonwealth of Independent States. All this not in 2014, but in 1994, just barely after the Soviet Union's demise. None of those demands would be heard by the Ukrainian government, and although some of the region's pain was relived with economic aid from Kyiv, the local frustration with Ukraine wouldn't go away. During the 2004 Orange Revolution, Luhansk and Donetsk would spearhead a short-lived effort to create an autonomous bloc of eastern Ukrainian regions comprising nearly half the country's territory. In the following years, the region would catch heavy criticism from the rest of Ukraine as a backwater land of thugs and degenerates, and while calls for separatism calmed down a fair bit, Donetsk and Luhansk's strained relationship with Ukraine were clear decades prior to 2014 for those few Western observers who'd even thought to look. An attempted change to Ukrainian national language law didn't help during the 2014 Crimean crisis, uh, which would have made Ukrainian the nation's sole state language across the country, causing problems and, in the eyes of many, erasing the Russian language cultures of the Donbass, where it had previously been permissible to use Russian as a jurisdictional language. When a Ukrainian survey assessed the attitudes in the Donbass in early 2014 as protests were just starting up, it found that nearly two-thirds of Donbass Best residents wanted autonomous status for their region, while nearly all of the remaining voters were in favor of full separation from Ukraine. This is why it's important to emphasize the degree to which the Donbass's anti-Ukraine protests in 2014 were self-motivated. Whether or not any Westerners would agree, now or then, with the perceptions of the local population, those perceptions were that Crimea, freshly annexed into Russia, had been the beneficiaries of a positive or even benevolent effort from Russia. At this time, Ukraine was still reeling from the downfall of former pro-Russian president Viktor Yanukovych, and the Donbass's entire ethnic Russian population was skeptical of how Ukraine's new administration would seek closer ties with the European Union and change the status quo in their region. Fearing major change, the idea of annexation by Russia seemed like a favorable alternative for many people. Now, the scope of support for separatism was almost certainly way below the 90-plus percent of Donbass residents who allegedly voted in favor of DPR and LPR independence from Ukraine in elections that were roundly condemned just about everywhere but Russia as being entirely illegitimate. But Russia didn't just make up the idea that many people inside Donetsk and Luhansk were open to the idea of sovereignty or even Russian annexation. That sentiment was there before Russia started in on its plan to support the local separatist movements. Now, though, it's almost impossible to tell what the remaining residents of the Donbass feel or whether they'd consider themselves more loyal to Russia, Ukraine, or nobody at all. Certainly, the portion of the Donbass population that had previously been pro-Ukraine has been all but pushed out. And just as important, Donbass residents who might have wanted to and been able to move to Russia have largely done so. Forced evacuations of the civilian population and forced conscriptions of fighting-age men in the Donbass have cleared out the territory even further. The region's 2023 elections would have been a silly affair if they weren't so bleak, with Russian officials going door-to-door -door insisting that residents go vote, only to be watched by armed Russian police as they checked the very few government-approved boxes presented to them. International sources who attempted to gauge public opinion among the people who remain have largely been ineffective. On the one hand, those who are pro-Russian are unlikely to engage with Western investigators, and on the other hand, those who are pro-Ukrainian have only survived this long because they've learned the value of self-censorship. So, 
That's the internal element to Donetsk and Luhansk. But the Donbass region has had a parallel story to tell since 2014. That of its long-running, low-grade insurgency and its far more recent transition into a forward operating area and at times a battlefield in Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine. The violence really got out of hand on the 6th of April 2014, when hundreds of masked assailants stormed a facility belonging to the Security Service of Ukraine, or SBU, in the city of Donetsk. Gathering weapons, they captured the regional administration building shortly afterward, demanded that the regional council call for a referendum on joining Russia within a day's time, and when that demand wasn't met, the insurgency in Donetsk declared itself the independent Donetsk People's Republic. A similar sequence of events went down in Ukraine, and after a few days of fruitless attempts at de-escalation by the Ukrainian government, the separatists turned outward and started capturing towns. Among their number were so-called volunteers, who just happened to be part of the Russian military, but showed up with no insignia, coming north from Crimea under the command of one Colonel Igor Gergin. By Gergin's own telling after the fact, it was Gergin's troops' capture of one particular town, Slovyansk, that really kicked off the insurgency, and from there, combat began. Within days, Ukraine had its own counterinsurgency underway, although with hardly any time to mobilize forces or pivot units across the country, local Ukrainian troops were caught off guard and at times forced to surrender. It's around this same time that the war crimes began on the insurgent side, including summary executions and torture of local figures in the Donbass. They launched mass attacks on weapons depots and armories, gathering heavy weapons, artillery, and even tanks, captured radio and television stations, and started inflicting real casualties on the Ukrainian side. The violence, so far contained mostly to Donetsk, spilled over into Luhansk, where the insurgency picked up steam rapidly. And just as Ukrainian troops began to arrive in force with the intent of restoring order, a much larger Russian force had shown up, proper uniforms and everything, just over the Russian border with the Donbass. The message from Russia was clear. If Ukraine attempted to quash the insurgency, it would find itself fighting not just suspiciously Russian insurgents, but the full might of the Russian military. From there, things only got worse. Granted powers as the leader of the Donbass People's Militia after a successful Donetsk referendum, Igor Gherkin declared himself Donetsk's so-called supreme commander and took what was most likely the next choreographed step in Russia's charade. He petitioned Russia directly to send military support in order to protect against a claimed genocide and a NATO threat of intervention. The DPR and the LPR declared martial law. Russian orthodoxy was declared the state religion. Efforts to nationalize the local economy got underway, and a very prominent billionaire in Donetsk named Rinat Akhmetov was punished for an attempt to stand up to the DPR with a thousand-strong march on his personal mansion. The insurgents, disorganized and unprepared in the early days, now started to launch more successful ambushes and attacks on Ukrainian troops, and representatives from both breakaway regions agreed to create a confederacy called New Russia. By June, the separatists were receiving tanks, mobile rocket launchers, and a range of heavy weapons from Russia directly, and the insurgents proved that they could use them, shooting down a Ukrainian strategic airlifter airplane, an IL-76, and killing all 49 on board. The summer of 2014 saw a major shift in the conflict as the separatists' initial momentum died out and was replaced by a crushing Ukrainian counteroffensive. Under the pressure, separatist forces had little choice but to retreat, with many among their number defecting or deserting in the process. Igor Gherkin and his forces took unilateral control of Donetsk, while across the Donbass, splinter groups within the separatist movement stopped taking orders from their central command. The separatists were pushed back further and further toward the Russian border, defenses around Donetsk and Luhansk cities began to collapse, and then the unthinkable happened. On July the 17th, 2014, forces of the Donetsk People's Republic shot down Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 as it flew over Donetsk a blast, apparently mistaking it for a Ukrainian military aircraft. All souls on board, 298 in total, hailing from 11 nations, would perish. In the wake of the destruction of Flight 17, with the eyes of the world now open to the conflict raging in the Donbass, Ukraine continued its counteroffensive. The separatists' last holdouts in the countryside came tumbling down, and Igor Gherkin himself was forced to appeal to Russia to either support the Donbass urgently or condemn the insurgency to failure. Luhansk city was surrounded first, and then Donetsk, and Ukraine shelled Donetsk in particular with a withering, days-long artillery barrage. Igor Gherkin got out of town and was replaced. Russia washed its hands of the DPR and the LPR's internally chosen leadership, and it appeared as if the conflict might soon be on the verge of resolution. But if anybody in Ukraine or anyone watching around the world had thought that that war might come to a peaceful end, they were sorely mistaken. Instead, Russia invaded the Donbass directly. 
Amidst intense urban fighting between Ukraine and the insurgents in Donetsk and Luhansk cities, as well as surprise separatist attacks in other parts of the Donbass, Russian troop columns began to probe more and more overtly into Ukrainian territory. As Russia played dumb on the world stage about who these troop columns were made up of and how the occasional Russian had ended up in Ukraine, Russian troops and vehicles marked with white circle and triangle logos mounted a counteroffensive. With their forces exhausted and depleted, Ukraine was forced to pull back, largely withdrawing from the territory they'd fought so hard for without a fight. In areas where Ukraine could still fight separatists without Russian intervention, they did their best. But it was only a matter of time before Russia's pressure campaign would force them to retreat too. When urgent peace talks in Minsk, Belarus finally gave way to a ceasefire agreement in September, the Donbass had been ravaged by months of intense fighting that would pretend the incredible carnage of the full-scale war to come. Entire villages and towns had been destroyed. The cities of Donetsk and Luhansk were made up half of ruins, and thousands of civilians were estimated to have been killed, with a high proportion having been killed by Ukraine. The DPR and the LPR had been gutted by the fighting, with catastrophic losses sustained by both breakaway provinces. But so had Ukraine, whose fighters had been expelled from most of the Donbass after fighting tooth and nail and sacrificing more than half of their active combat equipment to take it back. Prisoners were exchanged in either direction. Donetsk and Luhansk were given a special status within Ukraine, but recognized as fundamentally Ukrainian. Separatist leaders and soldiers were granted immunity from prosecution, and humanitarian aid began flooding into the area. But the ceasefire reached in 2014 wasn't much of a ceasefire at all. And while it would take until 2022 for large-scale hostilities to really break, out in the Donbass again, the following years would be violent nonetheless. Separatist forces and Ukrainian military units would clash frequently in skirmishes and ambushes that occasionally waxed and waned into far heavier fighting. All the while, suspected columns of Russian troops remained present in the Donbass, a silent threat that if Ukraine escalated its skirmishes too far, Russia would hit back with a forceful reprisal. There were too many small battles over the course of the following years for us to relate them all to you here, especially because many of those skirmishes bore a close resemblance to each other. But, well, some stand out beyond the others. In January 2015, a weeks-long battle over the next international airport eventually resolved in a Ukrainian defeat and the near-total destruction of the airport itself, which has never been rebuilt. February 2017 saw heavy fighting around the Ukrainian city of Avdivka, which has since become a very recognizable name for close observers of the ongoing war. Dozens would die in the worst fighting in years. In 2018, DPR Prime Minister Alexander Zakachenko was blown up at a restaurant. As Ukrainian troop movements slowly ate away at the no-man's land, the had for so long kept the separatists and Ukrainian military apart. But as the 2010s gave way to the 2020s, rumblings in the Donbass seemed to indicate that a new phase of the conflict was on the horizon. Starting in early 2021, Russian troops began to arrive in force in the Voronezh and Rostov oblasts, or regions of Russia, as well as into Crimea, arrayed menacingly around Ukraine's borders. Tens of thousands of Russian soldiers descended on territory close to the border, and from there, things only got more bleak. By early 2022, fighting picked up all across the Donbass in separatist efforts that seemed more and more plainly designed to try and provoke Ukrainian retaliation that would, in turn, give Russia the pretext for invasion. Finally, Russia recognized the independence claims of the DPR and the LPR, a decisive move it had avoided making for nearly a decade of hostilities across the Donbass. That recognition came on February the 21st, 2022. And, well, we're all well aware of what happens after that. In the years since 2022, the Donbass has been one part breakaway region, one part forward staging area for the Russian military, and one part battlefield in a war that's seen tens of thousands killed across the region. In the early days, Russia and its separatist allies exploded outward from the Donbass into the broader Ukrainian east, and ever since Russia's lightning offensive towards Kiev failed spectacularly early in the war, the Donbass has been subject to the long ebb and flow of battle. From the grueling siege of Maripol to Ukraine's counter-offensive crashing through the Donbass, to a bitter Russian winter, a long series of protracted battles in Bakhmut and other Donbass cities and towns, and a second bitter winter that brings us to where we are today. Donetsk and Luhansk have seen some of the worst modern warfare in a generation, not just compared to prior years in Ukraine, but compared to the entire world. 
It's hosted the surge and the downfall of the Wagner Group. It's been battered by enough artillery to make parts of Ukraine look like the surface of the moon, and it's been thoroughly saturated with landmines and traps that will likely take generations to clear away, regardless of who eventually wins the war. All the while, the DPR and the LPR remain something of an enigma on the global stage, too geopolitically important in an active conflict to be regarded in the same way as, say, the Russian-backed breakaway regions of other nearby nations, but too thoroughly propped up by a wartime aggressor, Russia, for most of the world to even entertain the thought of recognizing them. Other than Russia, only Syria and North Korea officially recognize the DPR and the LPR, and just a small handful of other nations have voiced support of Russia's decision to recognize them. The rest of the world either outright condemns the DPR and LPR independence, or avoids weighing in on the issue entirely. With a lack of clarity on just how Ukraine's war with Russia will end, and a clear global consensus that welcoming two new sovereign nations from the Donbass into the international community is not on the cards, the futures of these two breakaway republics is murky at best. When we consider the fates of the DPR and the LPR, we do have to recognize the portion of the Donbass population that would rather see itself be part of Russia than be part of Ukraine. This is a consideration that goes far beyond Eastern Europe to countless corners of the globe, that hundreds of millions of people worldwide would rather belong to a different nation than the one that currently represents them. The idea that people in Donetsk and Luhansk would want to keep their homes and remain in their communities, but swear allegiance to a different power than the one with internationally recognized claims to their territory, is no less real than when that desire is expressed by Kurds, or Palestinians, or Catalans, or Somalilanders, or Quebecois, or any number of other peoples around the world. That is the cold, hard reality of geopolitics, that people and their allegiances are not always reflected by the borders around them. But in the case of the Donbass, we also have to recognize the fact that most of the people who would have had those conversations about Donetsk and Luhansk's future are already long gone and they're probably not coming back. Those who wish to remain in Ukraine have gone and started new lives there. Those who wish to be Russian have since gone to Russia. And those few who've stayed despite evacuation orders are predominantly the elderly, who may end their natural lives before Russia's war with Ukraine reaches a conclusion that could come months or several years from now. If it were held today, even a free, fair referendum on the fate of the Donbass would be held among pro-separatist factions who chose to stay, and residents who've had to stay only to spend the following decade dodging bullets and being beaten into submission. Instead, there are three scenarios to consider when it comes to the DPR and LPR's final fates. Two involving repopulation, and one involving depopulation. Ultimately, what happens in the Donbass will be decided by what happens over the remaining course of Russia's war with Ukraine, with that war eventually deciding control of the territory in the long term. Russia can retain its control over the Donbass either by securing the territory for itself or establishing it as an autonomous zone in an eventual peace settlement with Ukraine. Ukraine can regain control of the Donbass militarily or have it returned via a peace accord that restores Ukraine's pre-2014 borders, or the region can empty itself even more completely, paving the way for a no-man's land, a true buffer zone between Russia and the eventual NATO nation of Ukraine. Of all three possibilities, it does appear as if the most likely, as we write this episode in early 2024, is that Russia will maintain dominion over Donetsk and Luhansk in some way. As we mentioned, there are two main mechanisms Russia could use to do this. First, there's the potential for Russia to make good on its 2022 annexation of the DPR and the LPR, transforming them into the same sorts of political entity inside Russia as the republics of Chechnya, Ingushetia, Tatarstan, and over a dozen others. That's technically how Russia considers the DPR and the LPR even now. But with the issue settled at the end of the war, Russia would be able to administer those regions more similarly to how it administers the rest of its federative republics. A significant component of that administration would likely be a resettlement of the area, undoubtedly involving a population that is primarily ethnic Russian. A second possible outcome that would see Donetsk and Luhansk remain under Russian control would involve Russia transferring the regions back to Ukraine as part of a peace deal, but stipulating that they be granted autonomous self-governing status and potentially insisting that Russian peacekeeping troops be stationed there, similar to what's happened in the Georgian region of Abkhazia and the Moldovan region of Transnistria. That would allow Russia to maintain de facto control over Donetsk and Luhansk, possibly even taking steps to repopulate the area with Russian migrants, while just barely satisfying Ukraine's demand for a return of the Donbass in order to secure a peace. 
Less likely, at least as it stands now, is that Ukraine will either militarily surge to recapture the Donbass entirely, or that it'll have the Donbass unequivocally return to it when an eventual peace deal between Russia and Ukraine is signed. In that case, it's likely that separatists who haven't yet fled to Russia would face severe prosecution under Ukrainian law. Far less clear is whether the region would be resettled, possibly by people who had to flee the area prior to the 2022 invasion, and whether Ukraine would attempt to set up strong pro-government regional administrations versus attempting to work with more moderate but still less Kyiv-friendly locals. The Donbass was flagging badly even prior to 2014, and any reconstruction efforts there would likely prove extremely costly, even without attempting to address the region's broader historical malaise. And finally, there's the possibility that the Donbass could become the last casualty of the Russia-Ukrainian war, signed away in part or in full as a no-man's land or demilitarized zone similar to the one separating North and South Korea. Among Vladimir Putin's clearest actual motivations for his invasion of Ukraine appears to be his long-held belief that a buffer zone between NATO and Russia is essential. And the Donbass is now mostly depopulated, with its few remaining residents probably happy to leave for either Ukraine or Russia if they were provided the means to do so. The world can live without Donbass coal. And Ukraine and Russia could likely come to terms in order to establish safe mining zones within the no-man's land if they ever felt so inspired. This version of the future for the Donbass, saturated with landmines and watched carefully from both sides of the border, would be exceptionally bleak. And it probably wouldn't just include the Donbass. Russia shares nearly 2,000 kilometers of land border with Ukraine, stretching all the way down from the Black Sea near Maripol to the northern reaches near Kharkiv and Chernihiv. A DMZ that includes the Donbass would likely need to include at least a narrow strip of the entire border, a sort of 21st century facsimile of the Iron Curtain that divided Eastern and Western Europe for so long. No matter the eventual outcomes, the Ukrainian provinces, the Russian oblasts, the breakaway territories, the unrecognized nations, the whatever you want to call them, Donetsk and Luhansk will bear the scars of the last decade for many decades to come. This once quiet, backwater corner of the world has caught the full brunt of some of the worst violence and most intense geopolitical machinations of the 21st century so far, and the ordeal is far from over. With so much yet unknown, one thing is certain. The Donbass that will be left behind in the aftermath of the Russia-Ukrainian war will be a shadow of what it once was, a burned-out wreck of a territory that bears little resemblance to what its people had hoped it could be, either under Ukraine or under Russia. Given the choice between two diametrically opposed futures, Donetsk and Luhansk have instead been shoved unceremoniously down toward a third option. Utter ruin, where nothing but memory can survive for long.